Story number 46 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Household Tales by Jacob and Willem Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. Fitcher's Bird. There was once a wizard who used to take the form of a poor man and went to houses and begged and caught pretty girls. No one knew whither he carried them, for they were never seen more. One day he appeared before the door of a man who had three pretty daughters. He looked like a poor, weak beggar, and carried a basket on his back, as if he meant to collect charitable gifts in it. He begged for a little food, and when the eldest daughter came out, and was just reaching him a piece of bread, he did but touch her, and she was forced to jump into his basket. Thereupon he hurried away with long strides and carried her away into a dark forest to his house, which stood in the midst of it. Everything in the house was magnificent. He gave her whatsoever she could possibly desire and said, My darling, thou wilt certainly be happy with me, for thou hast everything thy heart can wish for. This lasted a few days, and then he said, I must journey forth and leave thee alone for a short time. There are the keys to the house. Thou must go everywhere and look at everything except into one room, which this little key here opens, and there I forbid thee to go on pain of death. He likewise gave her an egg and said, Preserve the egg carefully for me, and carry it continually about with thee, for a great misfortune would arise from the loss of it. She took the keys and the egg, and promised to obey him in everything. When he was gone, she went all round the house, from the bottom to the top, and examined everything. The room shone with silver and gold, and she thought she had never seen such great splendor. At length she came to the forbidden door. She wished to pass by it, but curiosity let her have no rest. She examined the key. It looked just like any other key. She put it in the keyhole and turned it a little, and the door sprang open. But what did she see when she went in? A great bloody basin stood in the middle of the room, and therein lay human beings, dead and hewn to pieces. And hard by was a block of wood, and a gleamy axe lay upon it. She was so terribly alarmed that the egg which she held in her hand fell into the basin. She got it out and washed the blood off, but in vain it appeared again in a moment. She washed and scrubbed, but she could not get it out. It was not long before the man came back from his journey, and the first things which he asked for were the key and the egg. She gave them to him, but she trembled as she did so, and he saw at once by the red spots that she had been in the bloody chamber. Since thou hast gone into the room against my will, said he, thou shalt go back into it against thine own. Thy life is ended. He threw her down, dragged her thither by her hair, cut her head off on the block, and hewed her in pieces, so that her blood ran on the ground. Then he threw her into the basin with the rest. Now I will fetch myself the second, said the wizard, and again he went to the house in the shape of a poor man and begged. Then the second daughter brought him a piece of bread. He caught her like the first by simply touching her and carried her away. She did not fare better than her sister. She allowed herself to be led away by her curiosity, opened the door of the bloody chamber, looked in, and had to atone for it with her life, on the wizard's return. Then he went and brought the third sister, but she was clever and crafty. When he had given her the key and the egg, and had left her, she first put the egg away with great care, and then she examined the house, and at last went into the forbidden room. Alas, what did she behold? Both her sisters lay there in the basin, cruelly murdered and cut in pieces, but she began to gather their limbs together and put them in order, head, body, arms, and legs. And when nothing further was wanting, the limbs began to move. 
and unite themselves together, and both the maidens opened their eyes and were once more alive. Then they rejoiced and kissed and caressed each other. On his arrival the man at once demanded the keys and the egg, and as he could perceive no trace of any blood on it, he said, Thou hast stood the test, thou shalt be my bride. He now had no longer any power over her, and was forced to do whatsoever she desired. Oh, very well, said she, thou shalt first take a basket full of gold to my father and mother, and carry it thyself on thy back. In the meantime, I will prepare for the wedding. Then she ran to her sisters, whom she had hidden in a little chamber, and said, The moment has come when I can save you. The wretch shall himself carry you home again. But as soon as you are at home, send help to me. She put both of them in a basket and covered them quite over with gold, so that nothing of them was to be seen. Then she called in the wizard and said to him, Now, carry the basket away, but I shall look through my little window and watch to see if thou stoppest on the way to stand or to rest. The wizard raised the basket on his back and went away with it, but it weighed him down so heavily that the perspiration streamed from his face. Then he sat down and wanted to rest a while, but immediately one of the girls in the basket cried, I am looking through my little window, and I see that thou art resting. Wilt thou go on at once? He thought it was his bride who was calling that to him and got up on his legs again. Once more he was going to sit down, but instantly she cried, I am looking through my little window, and I see that thou art resting. Wilt thou go on directly? And whenever he stood still, she cried this, and then he was forced to go onwards, until at last, groaning and out of breath, he took the basket with the gold and the two maidens into their parents' house. At home, however, the bride prepared the marriage feast and sent invitations to the friends of the wizard. Then she took a skull with grinning teeth, put some ornaments on it, and a wreath of flowers, carried it upstairs to the garret window, and let it look out from a fence. When all was ready, she got into a barrel of honey, and then cut the feather bed open and rolled herself in it, until she looked like a wondrous bird, and no one could recognize her. Then she went out of the house, and on her way she met some of the wedding guests, who asked, Oh, Fitcher's bird, how comest thou here? I came from Fitcher's house quite near. And what may the young bride be doing? From cellar to garret she's swept all clean, and now from the window she's peeping, I ween. At last she met the bridegroom, who was coming slowly back. He, like the others, asked, O oh, Fitcher's bird, how comest thou here? I come from Fitcher's house quite near, and what may the young bride be doing? From cellar to garret she's swept all clean, and now from the window she's peeping, I ween. The bridegroom looked up, saw the decked-out skull, thought it was his bride, and nodded to her, greeting her kindly. But when he and his guests had all gone into the house, the brothers and kinsmen of the bride, who had been sent to rescue her, arrived. They locked all the doors of the house that no one might escape, and set fire to it, and the wizard and all his crew had to burn. End of story 46story 47 of household tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by hannah parrot household tales by jacob and wilhelm grimm translated by margaret hunt the juniper tree it is now long ago quite two thousand years since there was a rich man who had a beautiful and pious wife and they loved each other dearly they had however no children though they wished for them very much and the woman prayed for them day and night but still they had none now there was a courtyard in front of their house in which was a juniper tree 
and one day in winter the woman was standing beneath it paring herself an apple and while she was paring herself the apple she cut her finger and the blood fell on the snow ah said the woman and sighed right heavily and looked at the blood before her and was most unhappy ah if i had but a child as red as blood and as white as snow and while she thus spake she became quite happy in her mind and felt just as if that were going to happen then she went into the house and a month went by and the snow was gone and two months and then everything was green and three months and then all the flowers came out of the earth and four months and then all the trees in the wood grew thicker and the green branches were all closely entwined and the birds sang until the wood resounded and the blossoms fell from the trees then the fifth month passed away and she stood under the juniper tree which smelt so sweetly that her heart leapt and she fell on her knees and was beside herself with joy and when the sixth month was over the fruit was large and fine and then she was quite still and the seventh month she snatched at the juniper berries and ate them greedily then she grew sick and sorrowful then the eighth month passed and she called her husband to her and wept and said if i die then bury me beneath the juniper tree then she was quite comforted and happy until the next month was over and then she had a child as white as snow and as red as blood and when she beheld it she was so delighted that she died then her husband buried her beneath the juniper tree and he began to weep sore after some time he was more at ease and though he still wept he could bear it and after some time longer he took another wife by the second wife he had a daughter but the first wife's child was a little son and he was as red as blood and as white as snow when the woman looked at her daughter she loved her very much but then she looked at the little boy and it seemed to cut her to the heart for the thought came into her mind that he would always stand in her way and she was for ever thinking how she could get all the fortune for her daughter and the evil one filled her mind with this till she was quite wroth with the little boy and slapped him here and cuffed him there until the unhappy child was in continual terror for when he came out of school he had no peace in any place one day the woman had gone upstairs to her room and her little daughter went up too and said mother give me an apple yes my child said the woman and gave her a fine apple out of the chest but the chest had a great heavy lid with a great sharp iron lock mother said the little daughter is brother not to have one too this made the woman angry but she said yes when he comes out of school and when she saw from the window that he was coming it was just as if the devil entered into her and she snatched at the apple and took it away again from her daughter and said thou shalt not have one before thy brother then she threw the apple into the chest and shut it then the little boy came in at the door and the devil made her say to him kindly my son wilt thou have an apple and she looked wickedly at him mother said the little boy how dreadful you look yes give me an apple then it seemed to her as if she were forced to say to him come with me and she opened the lid of the chest and said take out an apple for thyself and while the little boy was stooping inside the devil prompted her and crash she shut the lid down and his head flew off and fell among the red apples then she was overwhelmed with terror and thought if i could but make them think that it was not done by me so she went upstairs to her room to her chest of drawers and took a white handkerchief out of the top drawer and set the head on the neck again and folded the handkerchief so that nothing could be seen and she set him on a chair in front of the door and put the apple in his hand after this marlinchen came into the kitchen to her mother who was standing by the fire with a pan of hot water before her which she was constantly stirring round mother said marlinchen brother is sitting at the door but he looks quite white and has an apple in his hand i asked him to give me the apple but he did not answer me and i was quite frightened go back to him said her mother and if he will not answer thee give him a box on the ear so marlinchen went to him and said brother give me the apple but he was silent and she gave him a box on the ear on which his head fell down marlinchen was terrified and began crying and screaming and ran to her mother and said alas mother i have knocked my brother's head off and she wept and wept and could not be comforted 
malinchin said the mother what hast thou done but be quiet and let no one know it it cannot be helped now we will make him into black puddings then the mother took the little boy and chopped him into pieces put him into the pan and made him into black puddings but malinchin stood by weeping and weeping and all her tears fell into the pan and there was no need of any salt then the father came home and sat down to dinner and said but where is my son and the mother served up a great dish of black puddings and marlinchen wept and could not leave off then the father again said but where is my son ah said the mother he has gone across the country to his mother's great uncle he will stay there a while and what is he going to do there he did not even say good-bye to me oh he wanted to go and asked me if he might stay six weeks he is well taken care of there ah said the man i feel so unhappy lest all should not be right he ought to have said good-bye to me with that he began to eat and said malinchen why art thou crying thy brother will certainly come back then he said ah wife how delicious this food is give me some more and the more he ate the more he wanted to have and he said give me some more you shall have none of it it seems to me as if it were all mine and he ate and ate and threw all the bones under the table until he had finished the whole but marlinchen went away to her chest of drawers and took her best silk handkerchief out of the bottom drawer and got all the bones from beneath the table and tied them up in her silk handkerchief and carried them outside the door weeping tears of blood then the juniper tree began to stir itself and the branches parted asunder and moved together again just as if someone was rejoicing and clapping his hands at the same time a mist seemed to arise from the tree and in the centre of this mist it burned like a fire and a beautiful bird flew out of the fire singing magnificently and he flew high up in the air and when he was gone the juniper tree was just as it had been before and the handkerchief with the bones was no longer there Malinchin, however was as gay and happy as if her brother were still alive and she went merrily into the house and sat down to dinner and ate but the bird flew away and lighted on a goldsmith's house and began to sing my mother she killed me my father he ate me my sister little marlinchen gathered together all my bones tied them in a silken handkerchief laid them beneath the juniper tree Kawit, kawit, what a beautiful bird am I. The goldsmith was sitting in his workshop making a gold chain when he heard the bird which was sitting singing on his roof, and very beautiful the song seemed to him. He stood up, but as he crossed the threshold he lost one of his slippers. But he went away right up the middle of the street with one shoe on and one sock. He had his apron on, and in one hand he had the gold chain, and in the other the pincers, and the sun was shining brightly on the street then he went right on and stood still and said to the bird bird said he then how beautifully thou canst sing sing me that piece again no said the bird i'll not sing it twice for nothing give me the golden chain and then i will sing it again for thee there said the goldsmith there is the golden chain for thee now sing me that song again then the bird came and took the golden chain in his right claw and went and sat in front of the goldsmith and sang my mother she killed me my father he ate me my sister little marlinchen gathered together all my bones tied them in a silken handkerchief laid them beneath the juniper tree kuit kuit what a beautiful bird am i then the bird flew away to a shoemaker and lighted on his roof and sang my mother she killed me my father he ate me my sister little marlinchen gathered together all my bones tied them in a silken handkerchief laid them beneath the juniper tree kuit kuit what a beautiful bird am i the shoemaker heard that and ran out of doors in his shirt sleeves and looked up at his roof and was forced to hold his hand before his eyes lest the sun should blind him bird said he how beautifully thou canst sing then he called in at his door wife just come outside there is a bird look at that bird he just can sing well then he called his daughter and children and apprentices boys and girls and they all came up the street and looked at the bird and saw how beautiful he was and what fine red and green feathers he had and how like real gold his neck was and how the eyes in his head shone like stars 
bird said the shoemaker now sing me that song again nay said the bird i do not sing twice for nothing thou must give me something wife said the man go to the garret upon the top shelf there stands a pair of red shoes bring them down then the wife went and brought the shoes there bird said the man now sing me that piece again then the bird came and took the shoes in his left claw and flew back on the reef and sang my mother she killed me my father he ate me my sister little marlinchen gathered together all my bones tied them in a silken handkerchief laid them beneath the juniper tree Kawit, kawit, what a beautiful bird am i and when he had sung the whole he flew away in his right claw he had the chain and the shoes in his left and he flew far away to a mill and the mill went clip clap clip clap clip clap and in the mill sat twenty millers men hewing a stone and cutting hick hack hick hack hick hack and the mill went clip clap clip clap clip clap then the bird went and sat on a lime tree which stood in front of the mill and sang my mother she killed me then one of them stopped working my father he ate me then two more stopped working and listened to that my sister little marlinchen then four more stopped gathered together all my bones tied them in a silken handkerchief now eight only were hewing laid them beneath now only five the juniper tree and now only one kawit kawit what a beautiful bird am i then the last stopped also and heard the last words bird said he how beautifully thou singest let me too hear that sing that once more for me nay said the bird i will not sing twice for nothing give me the millstone and then i will sing it again yes said he if it belong to me only thou shouldst have it yes said the others if he sings again he shall have it then the bird came down and the twenty millers all set to work with a beam and raised the stone up and the bird stuck his neck through the hole and put the stone on as if it were a collar and flew on to the tree again and sang my mother she killed me my father he ate me my sister little marlinchen gathered together all my bones tied them in a silken handkerchief laid them beneath the juniper tree kawit kawit what a beautiful bird am i and when he had done singing he spread his wings and in his right claw he had the chain and in his left the shoes and round his neck the millstone and he flew far away to his father's house in the room sat the father the mother and marlinchen at dinner and the father said how light-hearted i feel how happy i am nay said the mother i feel so uneasy just as if a heavy storm were coming marlinchen however sat weeping and weeping and then came the bird flying and as it seated itself on the roof the father said ah i feel so truly happy and the sun is shining so beautifully outside i feel just as if i were about to see some old friend again nay said the woman i feel so anxious my teeth chatter and i seem to have fire in my veins and she tore her stays open but marlinchen sat in a corner crying and held her plate before her eyes and cried till it was quite wet then the bird sat on the juniper tree and sang my mother she killed me then the mother stopped her ears and shut her eyes and would not see or hear but there was a roaring in her ears like the most violent storm and her eyes burnt and flashed like lightning my father he ate me our mother says the man that is a beautiful bird he sings so splendidly and the sun shines so warm and there was a smell just like cinnamon my sister little marlinchen then Malinchin laid her head on her knees and wept without ceasing but the man said i am going out i must see the bird quite close oh don't go said the woman i feel as if the whole house were shaking and on fire but the man went out and looked at the bird gathered together all my bones tied them in a silken handkerchief laid them beneath the juniper tree kawit kawit what a beautiful bird am i on this the bird let the golden chain fall and it fell exactly round the man's neck and so exactly round it that it fitted beautifully then he went in and said just look what a fine bird that is and what a handsome gold chain he has given me and how pretty he is but the woman was terrified and fell down on the floor in the room and her cap fell off her head then sang the bird once more 
my mother she killed me would that i were a thousand feet beneath the earth so as not to hear that my father he ate me then the woman fell down again as if dead my sister little marlinchen ah said marlinchen i too will go out and see if the bird will give me anything and she went out gathered together all my bones tied them in a silken handkerchief then he threw the shoes down to her laid them beneath the juniper tree Kawit, kawit, what a beautiful bird am I. Then she was light-hearted and joyous, and she put on the new red shoes, and danced and leaped into the house. Ah, said she, I was so sad when I went out, and now I am so light-hearted. That is a splendid bird. He has given me a pair of red shoes. Well, said the woman, and sprang to her feet, and her hair stood up like flames of fire. I feel as if the world were coming to an end. I, too, will go out and see if my heart feels lighter. And as she went out of the door, crash, the bird threw down the millstone on her head, and she was entirely crushed by it. The father of Malinchen heard what had happened, and went out, and smoke, flames, and fire were rising from the place, and when that was over, there stood the little brother, and he took his father and Malinchen by the hand, and all three were right glad, and they went into the house to dinner, and eight. End of story 47. Story number 48 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Turner of Huntsville, Texas. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. Old Sultan. A farmer once had a faithful dog called Sultan, who had grown old and lost all his teeth, so that he could no longer hold anything fast. One day the farmer was standing with his wife before the house door, and said, Tomorrow I intend to shoot old Sultan. He is no longer of any use. His wife, who felt pity for the faithful beast, answered, He has served us so long and been so faithful that we might well give him his keep. Eh, what? said the man. You are not very sharp. He has not a tooth left in his mouth, and not a thief is afraid of him. Now he may be off. If he has served us, he has had good feeding for it. The poor dog who was lying stretched out in the sun not far off had heard everything, and was sorry that the morrow was to be his last day. He had a good friend, the wolf, and he crept out in the evening into the forest to him and complained of the fate that awaited him. Hark ye, gossip, said the wolf, be of good cheer. I will help you out of your trouble. I have thought of something. Tomorrow, early in the morning, your master is going with his wife to make hay, and they will take their little child with them, for no one will be left behind in the house. They are wont, during work time, to lay the child under the hedge in the shade. You lay yourself there, too, just as if you wished to guard it. Then I will come out of the wood and carry off the child. You must rush swiftly after me as if you would seize it again from me. I will let it fall, and you will take it back to its parents, who will think that you have saved it, and will be far too grateful to do you any harm. On the contrary, you will be in high favor, and they will never let you want for anything again. The plan pleased the dog, and it was carried out just as it was arranged. The father screamed when he saw the wolf running across the field with his child, but when old Sultan brought it back, then he was full of joy, and stroked him, and said, Not a hair of yours shall be hurt. You shall eat my bread free as long as you live. And to his wife he said, Go home at once, and make old Sultan some bread sop that he will not have to bite, and bring the pillow out of my bed. I will give him that to lie upon. Henceforth old Sultan was as well off as he could wish to be. Soon afterwards the wolf visited him, and was pleased that everything had succeeded so well. But gossip, said he, you will just wink an eye if when I have a chance I carry off one of your master's fat sheep. Do not reckon upon that, answered the dog. I will remain true to my master. I cannot agree to that. The wolf, who thought that this could not be spoken in earnest, came creeping about in the night and was going to take away the sheep. But the farmer, to whom the faithful sultan had told the wolf's plan, caught him and dressed his hide soundly with the flail. The wolf had to pack off, but he cried out to the dog, Wait a bit, you scoundrel, you shall pay for this. 
The next morning the wolf sent the boar to challenge the dog to come out into the forest so that they might settle the affair. Old Sultan could find no one to stand by him but a cat with only three legs, and as they went out together the poor cat limped along and at the same time stretched out her tail into the air with pain. The wolf and his friend were already on the spot appointed, but when they saw their enemy coming they thought that he was bringing a saber with him, for they mistook the outstretched tail of the cat for one, and when the poor beast hopped on its three legs they could only think every time that it was picking up a stone to throw at them, so they were both afraid. The wild boar crept into the underwood, and the wolf jumped up a tree. The dog and the cat, when they came up, wondered that there was no one to be seen. The wild boar, however, had not been able to hide himself altogether, and one of his ears was still to be seen. Whilst the cat was looking carefully about, the boar moved his ear. The cat, who thought it was a mouse moving there, jumped upon it and bit it hard. The boar made a fearful noise and ran away, crying out, The guilty one is up in the tree. The dog and cat looked up and saw the wolf, who was ashamed of having shown himself so timid, and made friends with the dog. End of story number 48「Story forty nine of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Six Swans. Once upon a time, a certain king was hunting in a great forest and he chased a wild beast so eagerly that none of his attendants could follow him. When evening drew near, he stopped and looked around him, and then he saw that he had lost his way. He sought a way out, but could find none. Then he perceived an aged woman, with a head which nodded perpetually, who came towards him, but she was a witch. "'Good woman,' said he to her, "'can you not show me the way through the forest?' "'Oh, yes, Lord King,' she answered. "'That I certainly can, but on one condition. "'And if you do not fulfill that, "'you will never get out of the forest "'and will die of hunger in it.' "'What condition is it?' asked the king. "'I have a daughter,' said the old woman, "'who is as beautiful as anyone in the world "'and well deserves to be your consort. "'And if you will make her your queen,' I will show you the way out of the forest. In the anguish of his heart the king consented, and the old woman led him to her little hut, where her daughter was sitting by the fire. She received the king as if she had been expecting him, and he saw that she was very beautiful. But still she did not please him, and he could not look at her without secret horror. After he had taken the maiden up on his horse, the old woman showed him the way, and the king reached his royal palace again, where the wedding was celebrated. The king had already been married once, and had by his first wife seven children, six boys and a girl, whom he loved better than anything else in the world. As he now feared that the stepmother might not treat them well, and even do them some injury, he took them to a lonely castle which stood in the midst of a forest. It lay so concealed, and the way was so difficult to find, that he himself would not have found it if a wise woman had not given him a ball of yarn with wonderful properties. When he threw it down before him, it unrolled itself and showed him his path. The king, however, went so frequently away to his dear children that the queen observed his absence. She was curious and wanted to know what he did when he was quite alone in the forest. She gave a great deal of money to his servants, and they betrayed the secret to her, and told her likewise of the ball which could alone point out the way. And now she knew no rest until she had learnt where the king kept the ball of yarn, and then she made little shirts of white silk, and as she had learnt the art of witchcraft from her mother, she sewed a charm inside them. And once, when the king had ridden forth to hunt, she took the little shirts and went into the forest, and the ball showed her the way. The children, who
who saw from a distance that someone was approaching, thought that their dear father was coming to them, and full of joy ran to meet him. Then she threw one of the little shirts over each of them, and no sooner had the shirts touched their bodies than they were changed into swans and flew away over the forest. The queen went home quite delighted and thought she had got rid of her stepchildren, but the girl had not run out with her brothers, and the queen knew nothing about her. Next day the king went to visit his children, but he found no one but the little girl. "'Where are thy brothers?' asked the king. "'Alas, dear father,' she answered, "'they have gone away and left me alone.' And she told him that she had seen from her little window how her brothers had flown away over the forest in the shape of swans, and she showed him the feathers which they had let fall in the courtyard and which she had picked up. The king mourned, but he did not think that the queen had done this wicked deed and as he feared that the girl would also be stolen away from him, he wanted to take her away with him. But she was afraid of her stepmother, and entreated the king to let her stay just this one more night in the forest castle. The poor girl thought, I can no longer stay here. I will go and seek my brothers. And when night came, she ran away and went straight into the forest. She walked the whole night long, the next day also without stopping, until she could go no farther for weariness. Then she saw a forest hut and went into it, and found a room with six little beds, but she did not venture to get into one of them, but crept under one, and lay down on the hard ground, intending to pass the night there. Just before sunset, however, she heard a rustling, and saw six swans come flying in at the window. They alighted on the ground, and blew at each other, and blew all their feathers off, and their swan skins stripped off like a shirt. Then the maiden looked at them and recognized her brothers, and was glad and crept forth from beneath the bed. The brothers were not less delighted to see their little sister, but their joy was of short duration. Here canst thou not abide, they said to her, This is a shelter for robbers. If they come home and find thee, they will kill thee. But can you not protect me? asked the little sister. No, they replied. Only for one quarter of an hour each evening can we lay aside our swan skins and have during the time our human form. After that we are once more turned into swans. The little sister wept and said, Can you not be set free? Alas, no, they answered, the conditions are too hard. For six years thou mayest not speak nor laugh, and in that time thou must sew together six little shirts of starwort for us, and if one single word falls from thy lips, all thy work will be lost. And when the brothers had said this, the quarter of an hour was over, and they flew out of the window again as swans. The maiden, however, firmly resolved to deliver her brothers, even if it should cost her her life. She left the hut, went into the midst of the forest, seated herself on a tree, and there passed the night. Next morning she went out and gathered starwort and began to sew. She could not speak to anyone, and she had no inclination to laugh. She sat there and looked at nothing but her work. When she had already spent a long time there, it came to pass that the king of the country was hunting in the forest, and his huntsmen came to the tree on which the maiden was sitting. They called to her and said, Who art thou? But she made no answer. Come down to us, they said. We will not do thee any harm. She only shook her head. As they pressed her further with questions, she threw her golden necklace down to them, and thought to content them thus. They, however, did not cease, and then she threw her girdle down to them, and as this also was to no purpose, her garters, and by degrees everything that she had on that she could do without, until she had nothing left but her shift. The huntsmen, however, did not let themselves be turned aside by that, but climbed the tree and fetched the maiden down, 
and led her before the king. The king asked, Who art thou? What art thou doing in the tree? But she did not answer. He put the question in every language that he knew, but she remained as mute as a fish. As she was so beautiful, the king's heart was touched, and he was smitten with a great love for her. He put his mantle on her, took her before him on his horse, and carried her to his castle. Then he caused her to be dressed in rich garments, and she shone in her beauty like the bright daylight, but no word could be drawn from her. He placed her by his side at table, and her modest bearing and courtesy pleased him so much that he said, She is the one whom I wish to marry, and no other woman in the world. And after some days he united himself to her. The king, however, had a wicked mother who was dissatisfied with this marriage, and spoke ill of the young queen. Who knows, said she, from whence the creature who can't speak comes. She is not worthy of a king. After a year had passed, when the queen brought forth her first child into the world, the old woman took it away from her, and smeared her mouth with blood as she slept. Then she went to the king and accused the queen of being a man-eater. The king would not believe it, and would not suffer anyone to do her any injury. She, however, sat continually sewing at her shirts, and cared for nothing else. The next time, when she again bore a beautiful boy, the false stepmother used the same treachery, but the king could not bring himself to give credit to her words. He said, she is too pious and good to do anything of that kind. If she were not dumb and could defend herself, her innocence would come to light. But when the old woman stole away the newly born child for the third time and accused the queen, who did not utter one word of defense, the king could do no otherwise than deliver her over to justice, and she was sentenced to suffer death by fire. When the day came for the sentence to be executed, it was the last day of the six years during which she was not to speak or laugh, and she had delivered her brothers from the power of the enchantment. The six shirts were ready, only the left sleeve of the sixth was wanting. When, therefore, she was led to the stake, she laid the shirts on her arm, and when she stood on high and the fire was just going to be lighted, she looked around and six swans came flying through the air towards her. Then she saw that her deliverance was near, and her heart leapt with joy. The swans swept towards her and sank down, so that she could throw the shirts over them, and as they were touched by them, their swan skins fell off, and her brothers stood in their own bodily form before her, and were vigorous and handsome. The youngest only lacked his left arm, and had in the place of it a swan's wing on his shoulder. They embraced and kissed each other, and the queen went to the king, who was greatly moved, and she began to speak, and said, Dearest husband, now I may speak and declare to thee that I am innocent and falsely accused. And she told him of the treachery of the old woman who had taken away her three children and hidden them, then, to the great joy of the king, they were brought thither, and as a punishment, the wicked stepmother was bound to the stake and burnt to ashes. But the king and the queen, with their six brothers, lived many years in happiness and peace. End of Story 49this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Boat Harbor, Houston, Texas. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. Briar Rose. A long time ago, there were a king and queen who said every day, Ah, if only we had a child they never had one. But it happened that once when the queen was bathing, a frog crept out of the water onto the land, 
and said to her, Your wish shall be fulfilled. Before a year has gone by, you shall have a daughter. What the frog had said came true, and the queen had a little girl who was so pretty that the king could not contain himself for joy and ordered a great feast. He invited not only his kindred, friends, and acquaintance, but also the wise women, in order that they might be kind and well disposed toward the child. There were thirteen of them in his kingdom, but as he had only twelve golden plates for them to eat out of, one of them had to be left at home. The feast was held with all manner of splendor, and when it came to an end, the wise women bestowed their magic gifts upon the baby. One gave virtue, another beauty, a third riches, and so on, with everything in the world that one can wish for. When eleven of them had made their promises, suddenly the thirteenth came in. She wished to avenge herself for not having been invited, and without greeting or even looking at any one, she cried with a loud voice, The king's daughter shall in her fifteenth year prick herself with a spindle and fall down dead. And without saying a word more, she turned round and left the room. They were all shocked. But the twelfth, whose good wish still remained unspoken, came forward, and as she could not undo the evil sentence, but only soften it, she said, It shall not be death, but a deep sleep of a hundred years, into which the princess shall fall. The king, who would fain keep his dear child from the misfortune, gave orders that every spindle in the whole kingdom should be burnt. Meanwhile, the gifts of the wise women were plenteously fulfilled on the young girl, for she was so beautiful, modest, good-natured, and wise, that everyone who saw her was bound to love her. It happened that on the very day when she was fifteen years old, the king and queen were not at home, and the maiden was left in the palace quite alone. So she went round into all sorts of places, looked into rooms and bedchambers just as she liked, and at last came to an old tower. She climbed up the narrow winding staircase and reached a little door. A rusty key was in the lock, and when she turned it, the door sprang open, and there in the little room sat an old woman with a spindle busily spinning her flax. "'Good day, old dame,' said the king's daughter. "'What are you doing there?' "'I am spinning,' said the old woman, and nodded her head. "'What sort of thing is that that rattles round so merrily?' said the girl. And she took the spindle and wanted to spin, too. But scarcely had she touched the spindle when the magic decree was fulfilled, and she pricked her finger with it. And in the very moment when she felt the prick, she fell down upon the bed that stood there, and lay in a deep sleep. And this sleep extended over the whole palace. The king and queen, who had just come home and entered the great hall, began to sleep, and the whole of the court with them. The horses, too, went to sleep in the stable, the dogs in the yard, the pigeons upon the roof, the flies on the wall. Even the fire that was flaming on the hearth became quiet and slept. The roast meat left off frizzling, and the cook, who was just going to pull the hair of the scullery boy because he had forgotten something, let him go and went to sleep. And the wind fell, and on the trees before the castle not a leaf moved again. But round about the castle there began to grow a hedge of thorns, which every year became higher, and at last grew close up round the castle and all over it, so that there was nothing of it to be seen, not even the flag upon the roof. But the story of the beautiful sleeping Briar Rose, for so the princess was named, went about the country, so that from time to time king's sons came and tried to get through the thorny hedge into the castle. But they found it impossible, for the thorns held fast together, as if they had hands, and the youths were caught in them, could not get loose again, and died a miserable death. After long, long years, a king's son came again to that country, and heard an old man talking about the thorn hedge, and that a castle was said to stand behind it, in which a wonderfully beautiful princess named Briar Rose had been asleep for a hundred years and that the king and queen and the whole court were asleep likewise he had heard too from his grandfather that many king's sons had already come and had tried to get through the thorny hedge but they had remained sticking fast in it and had died a pitiful death then the youth said i am not afraid i will go and see the beautiful briar rose the good old man might dissuade him as he would 
he did not listen to his words. But by this time the hundred years had just passed, and the day had come when Briar Rose was to awake again. When the king's son came near to the thorn hedge, it was nothing but large and beautiful flowers, which parted from each other of their own accord and let him pass unhurt. Then they closed again behind him like a hedge. In the castle yard he saw the horses and the spotted hounds lying asleep. On the roof sat the pigeons with their heads under their wings, and when he entered the house the flies were asleep upon the wall. The cook in the kitchen was still holding out his hand to seize the boy, and the maid was sitting by the black hen which she was going to pluck. He went on further, and in the great hall he saw the whole of the court lying asleep, and up by the throne lay the king and queen. Then he went on still farther, and all was so quiet that a breath could be heard, and at last he came to the tower and opened the door into the little room where Briar Rose was sleeping. There she lay, so beautiful that he could not turn his eyes away, and he stooped down and gave her a kiss. But as soon as he kissed her, Briar Rose opened her eyes and awoke, and looked at him quite sweetly. Then they went down together, and the king awoke, and the queen, and the whole court, and looked at each other in great astonishment. And the horses in the courtyard stood up and shook themselves. The hounds jumped up and wagged their tails. The pigeons upon the roof pulled out their heads from under their wings, looked round, and flew into the open country. The flies on the wall crept again, and the fire in the kitchen burned up and flickered and cooked the meat. The joint began to turn and frizzle again, and the cook gave the boy such a box on the ear that he screamed, and the maid plucked the fowl ready for the spit. And then the marriage of the king's son with Briar Rose was celebrated with all splendor, and they lived contented to the end of their days. End of Story 50《Story 51 of Household Tales》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason in Panama • Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm Translated by Margaret Hunt • Fundevogel — Bird Foundling there once was a forester who went into the forest to hunt, and as he entered it he heard a sound of screaming as if a little child were there. He followed the sound, and at last came to a high tree, and at the top of this a little child was sitting, for the mother had fallen asleep under the tree with the child, and a bird of prey had seen it in her arms, had flown down, snatched it away, and set it on the high tree. The forester climbed up, brought the child down, and thought to himself, Thou wilt take him home with thee, and bring him up with thy Lena. He took it home, therefore, and the two children grew up together. The one, however, which he had found on a tree, was called Fundevogel, because a bird had carried it away. Fundevogel and Lena loved each other so dearly, that when they did not see each other they were sad. The forester, however, had an old cook, who one evening took two pails and began to fetch water, and did not go once only, but many times out to the spring. Lena saw this and said, Hark you, old Sanna, why are you fetching so much water? If thou wilt never repeat it to any one, I will tell thee why. So Lena said, No, she would never repeat it to any one, and then the cook said, Early tomorrow morning, when the forester is out hunting, I will heat the water, and when it is boiling in the kettle, I will throw in Fundevogel, and will boil him in it. Betimes next morning the forester got up and went out hunting, and when he was gone the children were still in bed. Then Lena said to Fundevogel, If thou wilt never leave me, I too will never leave thee. Fundevogel said, Neither now nor ever will I leave thee. Then said Lena, Then I will tell thee. Last night old Sanna carried so many buckets of water into the house that I asked her why she was doing that, and she said that if I would promise not to tell anyone, 
she would tell me, and I said I would be sure not to tell anyone, and she said that early tomorrow morning when father was out hunting, she would set the kettle full of water, throw thee into it, and boil thee, but we will get up quickly, dress ourselves, and go away together. The two children therefore got up, dressed themselves quickly, and went away. When the water in the kettle was boiling, the cook went into the bedroom to fetch Wundervogel and throw him into it. But when she came in, and went to the beds, both the children were gone. Then she was terribly alarmed, and she said to herself, What shall I say now when the forester comes home and sees that the children are gone? They must be followed instantly to get them back again. Then the cook sent three servants after them, who were to run and overtake the children. The children, however, were sitting outside the forest, and when they saw from afar the three servants running, Lena said to Fundevogel, Never leave me, and I will never leave thee. Fundevogel said, Not now, nor ever. Then said Lena, Do thou become a rose tree, and I the rose upon it. When the three servants came to the forest, nothing was there but a rose tree and one rose on it, but the children were nowhere. Then said they, There is nothing to be done here, and they went home and told the cook that they had seen nothing in the forest but a little rose bush with one rose on it. Then the old cook scolded and said, You simpletons, you should have cut the rose bush in two and have broken off the rose and brought it home with you. Go and do it once. They had therefore to go out and look for the second time. The children, however, saw them coming from a distance. Then Lena said, Fundevogel, never leave me, and I will never leave thee. Fundevogel said, Neither now, nor ever. Said Lena, Then do thou become a church, and I'll be the chandelier in it. So when the three servants came, nothing was there but a church with a chandelier in it. They said therefore to each other, What can we do here? let us go home. When they got home the cook asked if they had not found them. So they said no, they had found nothing but a church, and that there was a chandelier in it. And the cook scolded them and said, You fools! Why did you not pull the church to pieces, and bring the chandelier home with you? And now the old cook herself got on her legs, and went with the three servants in pursuit of the children. The children, however, saw from afar that the three servants were coming, and the cook waddling after them. Then said Lena, Fundevogel, never leave me, and I will never leave thee. Then said Fundevogel, Neither now, nor ever. Said Lena, Be a fish pond, and I will be the duck upon it. The cook, however, came up to them, and when she saw the pond, she lay down by it, and was about to drink it up. But the duck swam quickly to her, seized her head in its beak, and drew her into the water, and there the old witch had to drown. Then the children went home together, and were heartily delighted, and if they are not dead, they are living still. End of Story 51、Story、number 52 of Household Tales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melvin Lee. Household Tales by Jacob and Willem Graham. Translated by Margaret Hunt. King Thrushbeard. A king had a daughter who was beautiful beyond all measure, but so proud and haughty withal that no suitor was good enough for her. She sent away one after the other and ridiculed them as well. Once the king made a great feast and invited thereto, from far and near, all the young men likely to marry. They were all marshalled in a row according to their rank and standing. First came the kings, then the grand dukes, then the princes, the earls, the barons, and the gentry. Then the king's daughter was led through the ranks, but to every one she had some objection to make. One was too fat, the wine cask, she said. Another was too tall, long and thin, has little in, 
the third was too short short and thick is never quick the fourth was too pale as pale as death the fifth too red a fighting cock the sixth was not straight enough a green log dried behind the stove so she had something to say against every one but she made herself especially merry over a good king who stood quite high up in the row and whose chin had grown a little crooked well she cried and laughed he has a chin like a thrush's beak and from that time he got the name of king thrush beard but the old king when he saw that his daughter did nothing but mock the people and despised all the suitors who were gathered there was very angry and swore that she should have for her husband the very first beggar that came to his door a few days afterwards a fiddler came and sang beneath the windows trying to earn a small alms when the king heard him he said let him come up so the fiddler came in in his dirty ragged clothes and sang before the king and his daughter and when he had ended he asked for a trifling gift the king said your song has pleased me so well that i will give you my daughter there to wife the king's daughter shuddered but the king said i have taken an oath to give you to the very first beggar man and i will keep it all she could say was in vain the priest was brought and she had to let herself be wedded to the fiddler on the spot when that was done the king said now it is not proper for you a beggar woman to stay any longer in my palace you must go away with your husband the beggar man led her out by the hand and she was obliged to walk away on foot with him when they came to a large forest she asked to whom does that beautiful forest belong it belongs to king thrushbeard if you had taken him it would have been yours ah oh, unhappy girl that i am if i had but taken king thrushbeard afterwards they came to a meadow and she asked again to whom does this beautiful green meadow belong it belongs to king thrushbeard if you had taken him it would have been yours ah oh, unhappy girl that i am if i had but taken king thrushbeard then came they to a large town and she asked again to whom does this fine large town belong it belongs to king thrushbeard if you had taken him it would have been yours ah oh, unhappy girl that i am if i had but taken king thrushbeard it does not please me said the fiddler to hear you always wishing for another husband am i not good enough for you at last they came to a very little hut and she said my goodness what a small house to whom does this miserable mean hovel belong the fiddler answered that is my house and yours where we shall live together she had to stoop in order to go in at the low door where are the servants said the king's daughter what servants answered the beggar man you must yourself do what you wish to have done just make a fire at once and set on water to cook my supper i am quite tired but the king's daughter knew nothing about lighting fires or cooking and the beggar man had to lend a hand himself to get anything fairly done when they had finished their scanty meal they went up to bed but he forced her to get up quite early in the morning in order to look after the house for a few days they lived in this way as well as might be and came to the end of all their provisions then the man said wife we cannot go on any longer eating and drinking here and earning nothing you weave baskets he went out cut some willows and brought them home then she began to weave but the tough willows wounded her delicate hands i see that this will not do said the man you had better spin perhaps you can do that better she sat down and tried to spin but the hard thread soon cut her soft fingers so that the blood ran down see said the man you are fit for no sort of work i have made a bad bargain with you now i will try to make a business with pots and earthenware you must sit in the market-place and sell the ware alas thought she if any of the people from my father's kingdom come to the market and see me sitting there selling how they will mock me but it was of no use 
she had to yield unless she chose to die in hunger. For the first time she succeeded well, for the people were glad to buy the woman's wares because she was good-looking, and they paid her what she asked. Many even gave her the money and left the pots with her as well. So they lived on what she had earned as long as it lasted. Then the husband bought a lot of new crockery. With this she sat down at the corner of the marketplace and set it round about her ready for sale. But suddenly there came a drunken hussar galloping along, and he rode right amongst the pots so that they were all broken into a thousand bits. She began to weep, and did not know what to do for fear. Alas, what will happen to me, cried she, what will my husband say to this? She ran home and told him of the misfortune. Who would seat herself at a corner of the marketplace with crockery, said the man? Leave off crying. I see very well that you cannot do any ordinary work, so I have been to our king's palace and have asked whether they cannot find a place for a kitchen maid, and they have promised me to take you. In that way you will get your food for nothing. The king's daughter was now a kitchen maid, and had to be at the cook's beck and call, and do the dirtiest work. In both her pockets she fastened a little jar, in which she took home her share of the leavings, and upon this they lived. It happened that the wedding of the king's eldest son was to be celebrated. So the poor woman went up and placed herself at the door of the hall to look on. When all the candles were lit and people, each more beautiful than the other, entered, and all was full of pomp and splendor, she thought of her lot with a sad heart and cursed the pride and haughtiness which had humbled her and brought her so great poverty. The smell of the delicious dishes which were being taken in and out reached her, and now and then the servants threw her a few morsels of them. These she put in her jars to take home. All at once the king's son entered, clothed in velvet and silk, with gold chains about his neck. And when he saw the beautiful woman standing by the door, he seized her by the hand, and would have danced with her. But she refused and shrank for fear, for she saw that it was King Thrushbeard, her suitor, whom she had driven away with scorn. Her struggles were of no avail. He drew her into the hall, but the string by which her pockets were hung broke. The pots fell down, the soup ran out, and the scraps were scattered all about. And when the people saw it, there arose general laughter and derision, and she was so ashamed that she would rather have been a thousand fathoms below the ground. She sprang to the door and would have run away, but on the stairs a man caught her and brought her back, and when she looked at him it was King Thrushbeard again, and he said to her kindly, Do not be afraid. I and the fiddler, who has been living with you in that wretched hovel, are one. For love of you I disguised myself so, and I also was the hussar who rode through your crockery. This was all done to humble your proud spirit, and to punish you for the insolence with which you mocked me. Then she wept bitterly and said, I have done great wrong, and I am not worthy to be your wife. But he said, Be comforted. The evil days are past. Now we will celebrate our wedding. Then the maids in waiting came and put on her the most splendid clothing, and her father and his whole court came and wished her happiness in her marriage with King Thrushbeard, and the joy now began in earnest. I wish you and I had been there too. End of story 52 Story 53 of Household Tales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Vittoria Kahn Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm Translated by Margaret Hunt Little Snow White 
once upon a time in the middle of winter when the flakes of snow were falling like feathers from the sky a queen sat at a window sewing and the frame of the window was made of black ebony and whilst she was sewing and looking out of the window at the snow she pricked her finger with a needle and three drops of blood fell upon the snow and the red looked pretty upon the white snow and she thought to herself would that i had a child as white as snow as red as blood and as black as the wood of the window frame soon after that she had a little daughter who was as white as snow and as red as blood and her hair was as black as ebony and she was therefore called little snow white and when the child was born the queen died after a year had passed the king took to himself another wife she was a beautiful woman but proud and haughty and she could not bear that any one else should surpass her in beauty she had a wonderful looking-glass and when she stood in front of it and looked at herself in it and said looking-glass looking-glass on the wall who in this land is the fairest of all the looking-glass answered thou o queen art the fairest of all then she was satisfied for she knew that the looking-glass spoke the truth but snow white was growing up and grew more and more beautiful and when she was seven years old she was as beautiful as the day and more beautiful than the queen herself and once when the queen asked her looking-glass 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 on the wall who in this land is the fairest of all it answered thou art fairer than all who are here lady queen but more beautiful still is snow white as i ween then the queen was shocked and turned yellow and green with envy from that hour whenever she looked at snow white her heart heaved in her breast she hated the girl so much and envy and pride grew higher and higher in her heart like a weed so that she had no peace day or night she called a huntsman and said take the child away into the forest i will no longer have her in my sight kill her and bring me back her heart as a token the huntsman obeyed and took her away but when he had drawn his knife and was about to pierce snow white's innocent heart she began to weep and said ah oh, dear huntsman leave me my life i will run away into the wild forest and never come home again and as she was so beautiful the huntsman had pity on her and said run away then you poor child the wild beasts will soon have devoured you thought he and yet it seemed as if a stone had been rolled from his heart since it was no longer needful for him to kill her and as a young boar just then came running by he stabbed it and cut out its heart and took it to the queen as proof that the child was dead the cook had to salt this and the wicked queen ate it and thought that she had eaten the heart of snow white but now the poor child was all alone in the great forest and so terrified that she looked at every leaf of every tree and did not know what to do then she began to run and ran over sharp stones and through thorns and the wild beasts ran past her but did her no harm she ran as long as her feet would go until it was almost evening then she saw a little cottage and went into it to rest herself everything in the cottage was small but neater and cleaner than can be told there was a table on which was a white cover and seven little plates and on each plate a little spoon moreover there were seven little knives and forks and seven little mugs against the wall stood seven little beds side by side and covered with snow-white counterpanes little snow-white was so hungry and thirsty that she ate some vegetables and bread from each plate and drank a drop of wine out of each mug for she did not want to take all from one only then as she was so tired she laid herself down on one of the little beds but none of them suited her one was too long another too short but at last she found that the seventh one was right and so she remained in it 
said a prayer, and went to sleep. When it was quite dark, the owners of the cottage came back. They were seven dwarfs who dug and delved in the mountains for ore. They lit their seven candles, and as it was now light within the cottage, they saw that somewhat had been there, for everything was not in the same order in which they had left it. The first said, Who has been sitting in my chair? The second said, Who has been eating off my plate? The third, Who has been taking some of my bread? The fourth, Who has been eating my vegetables? The fifth, Who has been using my fork? The sixth, Who has been cutting with my knife? The seventh, Who has been drinking out of my mug? Then the first looked round and saw that there was a little hole on his bed, and he said, Who has been getting into my bed? The others came up and each called out, Somebody has been lying in my bed too. But the seventh, when he looked at his bed, saw little Snow White, who was lying asleep therein. And he called the others, who came running up, and they cried out with astonishment, and brought their seven little candles and let the light fall on little Snow White. "'Oh, heavens, oh, heavens!' cried they. "'What a lovely child!' And they were so glad that they did not wake her up, but let her sleep on in the bed. And the seventh dwarf slept with his companions one hour with each, and so got through the night. When it was morning, little Snow White awoke, and was frightened when she saw the seven dwarfs. But they were friendly, and asked her what her name was. "'My name is Snow White,' she answered. "'How have you come to our house?' said the dwarfs. Then she told them that her stepmother had wished to have her killed, but that the huntsman had spared her life, and that she had run for the whole day until at last she had found their dwelling. The dwarfs said, "'If you will take care of our house, cook, make the beds, wash, sew, and knit, and if you will keep everything neat and clean, you can stay with us, and you shall want for nothing.' "'Yes,' said Snow White, with all my heart, and she stayed with them. She kept the house in order for them. In the mornings they went to the mountains and looked for copper and gold. In the evenings they came back, and then their supper had to be ready. The girl was alone the whole day, so the good dwarfs warned her and said, Beware of your stepmother. She will soon know that you are here. Be sure to let no one come in. But the queen, believing that she had eaten Snow White's heart, could not but think that she was again the first and most beautiful of all, and she went to her looking-glass and said, Looking-glass, looking-glass on the wall, who in this land is the fairest of all? And the glass answered, O queen, thou art fairest of all I see, but over the hills where the seven dwarfs dwell, Snow White is still alive and well and none is so fair as she. Then she was astounded, for she knew that the looking-glass never spoke falsely, and she knew that the huntsman had betrayed her, and that little Snow White was still alive. And so she thought and thought again how she might kill her, for so long as she was not the fairest in the whole land, Envy let her have no rest. And when she had at last thought of something to do, she painted her face and dressed herself like an old peddler woman, and no one could have known her. In this disguise she went over the seven mountains to the seven dwarfs, knocked at the door, and cried, "'Pretty things to sell, very cheap, very cheap!' Little Snow White looked out of the window and called out, "'Good day, my good woman. What have you to sell?' "'Good things, pretty things,' she answered. "'Stay laces of all colors.' And she pulled out one which was woven of bright-colored silk. "'I may let the worthy old woman in,' thought Snow White, and she unbolted the door and bought the pretty laces. "'Child,' said the old woman, "'what a fright you look. Come, I will lace you properly for once.' Snow White had no suspicion, but stood before her and let herself be laced with the new laces. But the old woman laced so quickly and so tightly that Snow White lost her breath and fell down as if dead. 
now i am the most beautiful said the queen to herself and ran away not long afterwards in the evening the seven dwarfs came home but how shocked they were when they saw their dear little snow white lying on the ground and that she neither stirred nor moved and seemed to be dead they lifted her up and as they saw that she was laced too tightly they cut the laces then she began to breathe a little and after a while came to life again when the dwarfs heard what had happened they said the old peddler woman was no one else than the wicked queen take care and let no one come in when we are not with you but the wicked woman when she had reached home went in front of the glass and asked looking glass looking glass on the wall who in this land is the fairest of all and it answered as before o queen thou art fairest of all i see but over the hills where the seven dwarfs dwell snow white is still alive and well and none is so fair as she when she heard that all her blood rushed to her heart with fear for she saw plainly that little snow white was alive again but now she said i will think of something that shall put an end to you and by the help of witchcraft which she understood she made a poisonous comb then she disguised herself and took the shape of another old woman so she went over the seven mountains to the seven dwarfs knocked at the door and cried good things to sell cheap cheap little snow white looked out and said go away i cannot let any one come in i suppose you can look said the old woman and pulled the poisonous comb out and held it up it pleased the girl so well that she let herself be beguiled and opened the door when they had made a bargain the old woman said now i will comb you properly for once poor little snow white had no suspicion and let the old woman do as she pleased but hardly had she put the comb in her hair than the poison in it took effect and the girl fell down senseless you paragon of beauty said the wicked woman you are done for now and she went away but fortunately it was almost evening when the seven dwarfs came home when they saw snow white lying as if dead upon the ground they at once suspected the stepmother and they looked and found the poisoned comb scarcely had they taken it out when snow white came to herself and told them what had happened then they warned her once more to be on her guard and to open the door to no one the queen at home went in front of the glass and said looking glass looking glass on the wall who in this land is the fairest of all then it answered as before o queen thou art fairest of all i see but over the hills where the seven dwarfs dwell snow white is still alive and well and none is so fair as she when she heard the glass speak thus she trembled and shook with rage snow white shall die she cried even if it costs me my life thereupon she went into a quite secret lonely room where no one ever came and there she made a very poisonous apple outside it looked pretty white with a red cheek so that every one who saw it longed for it but whoever ate a piece of it must surely die when the apple was ready she painted her face and dressed herself up as a countrywoman and so she went over the seven mountains to the seven dwarfs she knocked at the door snow white put her head out of the window and said i cannot let any one in the seven dwarfs have forbidden me it is all the same to me answered the woman i shall soon get rid of my apples there i will give you one no said snow white i dare not take anything are you afraid of poison said the old woman look i will cut the apple in two pieces you eat the red cheek and i will eat the white the apple was so cunningly made that only the red cheek was poisoned 
Snow White longed for the fine apple, and when she saw that the woman ate part of it, she could resist no longer, and stretched out her hand and took the poisonous half. But hardly had she a bit of it in her mouth, and she fell down dead. Then the queen looked at her with a dreadful look, and laughed aloud, and said, <laughs> White as snow, red as blood, black as ebony wood. This time the dwarfs cannot wake you up again. And when she asked of the looking-glass at home, Looking-glass, looking-glass on the wall, who in this land is the fairest of all? It answered at last, O queen, in this land thou art fairest of all. Then her envious heart had rest, so far as an envious heart can have rest. The dwarfs, when they came home in the evening, found Snow White lying upon the ground. She breathed no longer and was dead. They lifted her up, looked to see whether they could find anything poisonous, unlaced her, combed her hair, washed her with water and wine, but it was all of no use. The poor child was dead and remained dead. They laid her upon a bier, and all seven of them sat round it and wept for her, and wept three days long. Then they were going to bury her, but she still looked as if she were living, and still had her pretty red cheeks. They said, We could not bury her in the dark ground. And they had a transparent coffin of glass made, so that she could be seen from all sides, and they laid her in it, and wrote her name upon it in golden letters, and that she was a king's daughter. Then they put the coffin out upon the mountain, and one of them always stayed by it and watched it. And birds came, too, and wept for Snow White, first an owl, then a raven, and last a dove. And now Snow White lay a long, long time in the coffin, and she did not change, but looked as if she were asleep, for she was as white as snow, as red as blood, and her hair was as black as ebony. It happened, however, that a king's son came into the forest and went to the dwarf's house to spend the night. He saw the coffin on the mountain, and the beautiful snow white within it, and read what was written upon it in golden letters. Then he said to the dwarfs, Let me have the coffin. I will give you whatever you want for it. But the dwarfs answered, We will not part with it for all the gold in the world. Then he said, Let me have it as a gift, for I cannot live without seeing Snow White. I will honor and prize her as my dearest possession. As he spoke in this way, the good dwarfs took pity on him and gave him the coffin. And now the king's son had it carried away by his servants on their shoulders, and it happened that they stumbled over a tree stump and with the shock the poisonous piece of apple which Snow White had bitten off came out of her throat, and before long she opened her eyes, lifted up the lid of the coffin, sat up and was once more alive. "'Oh, heavens! Where am I?' she cried. The king's son, full of joy, said, "'You are with me!' and told her what had happened, and said, "'I love you more than everything in the world!' Come with me to my father's palace, you shall be my wife. And Snow White was willing, and went with him, and their wedding was held with great show and splendor. But Snow White's wicked stepmother was also bidden to the feast. When she had arrayed herself in beautiful clothes, she went before the looking glass and said, Looking glass, looking glass on the wall, who in this land is the fairest of all? The glass answered, O queen, of all here the fairest art thou, but the young queen is fairer by far as I trow. Then the wicked woman uttered a curse, and was so wretched, so utterly wretched, that she knew not what to do. At first she would not go to the wedding at all, but she had no peace, and must go to see the young queen. And when she went in, she knew Snow White, and she stood still with rage and fear and could not stir. But iron slippers had already been put upon the fire, and they were brought in with tongs and set before her. 
then she was forced to put on the red-hot shoes and dance until she dropped dead end of story fifty three Story 54 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Vittoria Kahn. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Knapsack, the Hat, and the Horn there were once three brothers who had fallen deeper and deeper into poverty and at last their need was so great that they had to endure hunger and had nothing to eat or drink then said they we cannot go on thus we had better go into the world and seek our fortune they therefore set out and had already walked over many a long road and many a blade of grass but had not yet met with good luck one day they arrived in a great forest and in the midst of it was a hill and when they came nearer they saw that the hill was all silver then spoke the eldest now i have the good luck i wished for and i desire nothing more he took as much of the silver as he could possibly carry and then turned back and went home again but the two others said we want something more from good luck than mere silver and did not touch it but went onwards after they had walked for two days longer without stopping they came to a hill which was all gold the second brother stopped took thought with himself and was undecided what shall i do said he shall i take for myself so much of this gold that i have sufficient for all the rest of my life or shall i go farther at length he made a decision and putting as much into his pockets as would go in said farewell to his brother and went home but the third said silver and gold do not move me i will not renounce my chance of fortune perhaps something better still will be given me he journeyed onwards and when he had walked for three days he got into a forest which was still larger than the one before and never would come to an end and as he found nothing to eat or to drink he was all but exhausted then he climbed up a high tree to find out if up there he could see the end of the forest but so far as his eye could pierce he saw nothing but the tops of trees then he began to descend the tree again but hunger tormented him and he thought to himself if i could but eat my fill once more when he got down he saw with astonishment a table beneath the tree richly spread with food the steam of which rose up to meet him this time said he my wish has been fulfilled at the right moment and without inquiring who had brought the food or who had cooked it he approached the table and ate with enjoyment until he had appeased his hunger when he was done he thought it would after all be a pity if the pretty little tablecloth were to be spoiled in the forest here and folded it up tidily and put it in his pocket then he went onwards and in the evening when hunger once more made itself felt he wanted to make a trial of his little cloth and spread it out and said i wish thee to be covered with good cheer again and scarcely had the wish crossed his lips than as many dishes with the most exquisite food on them stood on the table as there was room for now i perceive said he in what kitchen my cooking is done thou shalt be dearer to me than the mountains of silver and gold for he saw plainly that it was a wishing cloth the cloth however was still not enough to enable him to sit down quietly at home 
he preferred to wander about the world and pursue his fortune farther one night he met in a lonely wood a dusty black charcoal burner who was burning charcoal there and had some potatoes by the fire on which he was going to make a meal good evening blackbird said the youth how dost thou get on in thy solitude one day is like another replied the charcoal burner and every night potatoes hast thou a mind to have some and wilt thou be my guest many thanks replied the traveller i won't rob thee of thy supper thou didst not reckon on a visitor but if thou wilt put up with what i have thou shalt have an invitation who is to prepare it for thee said the charcoal burner i see that thou hast nothing with thee and there is no one within a two hours walk who could give thee anything and yet there shall be a meal answered the youth and better than any thou hast ever tasted thereupon he brought his cloth out of his knapsack spread it on the ground and said little cloth cover thyself and instantly boiled meat and baked meat stood there and as hot as if it had just come out of the kitchen the charcoal burner stared but did not require much pressing he fell to and thrust larger and larger mouthfuls into his black mouth when they had eaten everything the charcoal burner smiled contentedly and said hark thee thy tablecloth has my approval it would be a fine thing for me in this forest where no one ever cooks me anything good i will propose an exchange to thee there in the corner hangs a soldier's knapsack which is certainly old and shabby but in it lie concealed wonderful powers but as i no longer use it i will give it to thee for the tablecloth i must first know what these wonderful powers are answered the youth that i will tell thee replied the charcoal burner every time thou tappest it with thy hand a corporal comes with six men armed from head to foot and they do whatsoever thou commandest them so far as i am concerned said the youth if nothing else can be done we will exchange and he gave the charcoal burner the cloth took the knapsack from the hook put it on and bade farewell when he had walked a while he wished to make a trial of the magical powers of his knapsack and tapped it immediately the seven warriors stepped up to him and the corporal said what does my lord and ruler wish for march with all speed to the charcoal burner and demand my wishing cloth back they faced to the left and it was not long before they brought what he required and had taken it from the charcoal burner without asking many questions the young men bade them retire went onwards and hoped fortune would shine yet more brightly on him by sunset he came to another charcoal burner who was making his supper ready by the fire if thou wilt eat some potatoes with salt but with no dripping come and sit down with me said the sooty fellow no he replied this time thou shalt be my guest and he spread out his cloth which was instantly covered with the most beautiful dishes they ate and drank together and enjoyed themselves heartily after the meal was over the charcoal burner said up there on that shelf lies a little old worn-out hat which has strange properties when any one puts it on and turns it round on his head the cannons go off as if twelve were fired all together and they shoot down everything so that no one can withstand them the hat is of no use to me and i will willingly give it for thy tablecloth that suits me very well he answered took the hat put it on and left his tablecloth behind him hardly however had he walked away then he tapped on his knapsack and his soldiers had to fetch the cloth back again 
one thing comes on top of another thought he and i feel as if my luck had not yet come to an end neither had his thoughts deceived him after he had walked on for the whole of one day he came to a third charcoal burner who like the previous ones invited him to potatoes without dripping but he let him also dine with him from his wishing cloth and the charcoal burner liked it so well that at last he offered him a horn for it which had very different properties from those of the hat when any one blew it all the walls and fortifications fell down and all towns and villages became ruins he certainly gave the charcoal burner the cloth for it but he afterwards sent his soldiers to demand it back again so that at length he had the knapsack hat and horn all three now said he i am a made man and it is time for me to go home and see how my brothers are getting on when he reached home his brothers had built themselves a handsome house with their silver and gold and were living in clover he went to see them but as he came in a ragged coat with his shabby hat on his head and his old knapsack on his back they would not acknowledge him as their brother they mocked and said thou givest doubt that thou art our brother who despised silver and gold and craved for something still better for himself he will come in his carriage in full splendor like a mighty king not like a beggar and they drove him out of doors then he fell into a rage and tapped his knapsack until a hundred and fifty men stood before him armed from head to foot he commanded them to surround his brother's house and two of them were to take hazel sticks with them and beat the two insolent men until they knew who he was a violent disturbance arose people ran together and wanted to lend the two some help in their need but against the soldiers they could do nothing news of this at length came to the king who was very angry and ordered a captain to march out with his troop and drive this disturber of the peace out of the town but the man with the knapsack soon got a greater body of men together who repulsed the captain and his men so that they were forced to retire with bloody noses the king said this vagabond is not brought to order yet and the next day sent a still larger troop against him but they could do even less the youth set still more men against them and in order to be done the sooner he turned his hat twice round on his head and heavy guns began to play and the king's men were beaten and put to flight and now said he i will not make peace until the king gives me his daughter to wife and i govern the whole kingdom in his name he caused this to be announced to the king and the latter said to his daughter necessity is a hard nut to crack what remains to me but to do what he desires if i want peace and to keep the crown on my head i must give thee away so the wedding was celebrated but the king's daughter was vexed that her husband should be a common man who wore a shabby hat and put on an old knapsack she wished much to get rid of him and night and day studied how she could accomplish this then she thought to herself is it possible that his wonderful powers lie in the knapsack and she dissembled and caressed him and when his heart was softened she said if thou wouldst but lay aside that ugly knapsack it makes disfigures thee so that i can't help being ashamed of thee dear child said he this knapsack is my greatest treasure as long as i have it there is no power on earth that i am afraid of and he revealed to her the wonderful virtue with which it was endowed then she threw herself in his arms as if she were going to kiss him but dexterously took the knapsack off his shoulders and ran away with it as soon as she was alone she tapped it and commanded the warriors to seize their former master and take him out of the royal palace they obeyed and the false wife sent still more men after him who were to drive him quite out of the country 
then he would have been ruined if he had not had the little hat but his hands were scarcely at liberty before he turned it twice immediately the cannon began to thunder and struck down everything and the king's daughter herself was forced to come and beg for mercy as she entreated in such moving terms and promised amendment he allowed himself to be persuaded and granted her peace she behaved in a friendly manner to him and acted as if she loved him very much and after some time managed so to befool him that he confided to her that even if someone got the knapsack into his power he could do nothing against him so long as the old hat was still his when she knew the secret she waited until he was asleep and then she took the hat away from him and had thrown it out into the street but the horn still remained to him and in great anger he blew it with all his strength instantly all walls fortifications towns and villages toppled down and crushed the king and his daughter to death and had he not put down the horn and had blown just a little longer everything would have been in ruins and not one stone would have been left standing on another then no one opposed him any longer and he made himself king of the whole country End of story 54。story 55 of household tales。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org。household tales by jacob and wilhelm grimm。translated by margaret hunt。rumple stiltskin。Once there was a miller who was poor, but who had a beautiful daughter. Now it happened that he had to go and speak to the king, and in order to make himself appear important, he said to him, I have a daughter who can spin straw into gold. The king said to the miller, That is an art which pleases me well. If your daughter is as clever as you say, bring her tomorrow to my palace, and I will try what she can do. And when the girl was brought to him, he took her into a room which was quite full of straw, gave her a spinning wheel and a reel, and said, Now set to work, and if by tomorrow morning early you have not spun this straw into gold during the night you must die. Thereupon he himself locked up the room and left her in it alone. So there sat the poor miller's daughter, and for the life of her could not tell what to do. She had no idea how straw could be spun into gold, and she grew more and more miserable until at last she began to weep. But all at once the door opened, and in came a little man, and said, Good evening, Mistress Miller. Why are you crying so? Alas, answered the girl, I have to spin straw into gold, and I do not know how to do it. What will you give me, said the mannequin, if I do it for you? My necklace, said the girl. The little man took the necklace, seated himself in front of the wheel, and whirr, 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 three turns and the reel was full. Then he put another on, and whirr, 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 three times round, and the second was full too. And so it went on until the morning, when all the straw was spun, and all the reels were full of gold. By daybreak the king was already there, and when he saw the gold he was astonished and delighted, but his heart only became more greedy. He had the miller's daughter taken into another room full of straw, which was much larger and commanded her to spin that also in one night, if she valued her life. The girl knew not how to help herself, and was crying, when the door opened again, and the little man appeared, and said, What will you give me if I spin that straw into gold for you? The ring on my finger, answered the girl. The little man took the ring, again began to turn the wheel, and by morning had spun all the straw into glittering gold. The king rejoiced beyond measure at the sight, but still he had not gold enough, and he had the miller's daughter taken into a still larger room full of straw, and said, You must spin this too, in the course of this night, but if you succeed, you shall be my wife. Even if she be a miller's daughter, thought he, I could not find a richer wife in the whole world. When the girl was alone, the mannequin came again for the third time, and said, What will you give me if I spin the straw for you this time also? I have nothing left that I could give, 
answered the girl. Then promise me, if you should become queen, your first child. Who knows whether that will ever happen, thought the miller's daughter, and not knowing how else to help herself in this strait, she promised the mannequin what he wanted, and for that he once more span the straw into gold. And when the king came in the morning, and found all as he had wished, he took her in marriage, and the pretty miller's daughter became a queen. A year later, she had a beautiful child, and she never gave a thought to the mannequin. But suddenly he came into her room and said, Now give me what you promised. The queen was horror-struck, and offered the mannequin all the riches of the kingdom if he would leave her the child. But the mannequin said, No, something that is living is dearer to me than all the treasures in the world. Then the queen began to weep and cry, so that the mannequin pitied her. I will give you three days' time, said he. If by that time you find out my name, then shall you keep your child. So the queen thought the whole night of all the names that she had ever heard, and she sent a messenger over the country to inquire, far and wide, for any other names that there might be. When the mannequin came the next day, she began with Caspar, Melchior, Balthazar, and said all the names she knew, one after another. But to every one the little man said, that is not my name. On the second day she had inquiries made in the neighborhood as to the names of the people there, and she repeated to the mannequin the most uncommon and curious. Perhaps your name is Short Ribs, or Sheepshanks, or Lace Leg. But he always answered, that is not my name. On the third day the messenger came back again and said, I have not been able to find a single new name, but as they came to a high mountain at the end of the forest, where the fox and the hare bid each other good night. There I saw a little house, and before the house a fire was burning, and round about the fire quite a ridiculous little man was jumping. He hopped upon one leg and shouted, Today I bake tomorrow brew, the next I'll have the young queen's child. Ha! Glad am I that no one knew that Rumpelstiltskin I am styled. You may think how glad the queen was when she heard the name, and when soon afterwards the little man came in and asked, now, Mistress Queen, what is my name? At first she said, Is your name Conrad? No. Is your name Harry? No. Perhaps your name is Rumpelstiltskin. The devil has told you that! The devil has told you that! cried the little man, and in his anger he plunged his right foot so deep into the earth that his whole leg went in, and then in a rage he pulled at his left leg so hard with both hands that he tore himself in two. End of story 55